Let me start, uh, set the ball rolling uh, now. Uh, we've been hearing about uh, uh, the fiscal deficit target, how it is sacred. We just heard in the la last panel uh, a representative from a ratings company warning that deviating from uh, the deficit target would not be taken too kindly. We also hear the other views that uh, uh, we need to spend this year, especially because private spending is not uh, up to the mark. The government needs to step forward and fill in the gap. Now, I'd like to hear from you uh, in turn, starting with uh, uh, Pavan, on uh, where you stand on this debate. Um, so as a, as a rating agency, I think uh, it is important to be predictable. I think that is the key and that is becomes much more critical when we are talking about infrastructure sector where we are talking about very long term uh, perspective. So in all aspects it is, it is critical that, uh, that the government and the stakeholders are predictable. They can, they can know how things are likely to evolve as we go forward. And therefore if the, the direction has been set in a budget uh, in the past around certain expectations, I think it is important that those expectations are met. Uh, at the same time, it is equally important in our opinion to recognize that, uh, that the times may require for uh, some amount of changes uh, depending upon the situation. Uh, the, the more important goal within achieving this, these two balances is going to be, are we moving directionally on the path that the government has said? Uh, and that is something that is one aspect that I would uh, want to highlight. The second aspect I wanted to highlight is that more importantly the fiscal discipline would be required from a revenue uh, deficit perspective uh, and, and as long as after meeting a revenue deficit perspective uh, the additional borrowings are for investments uh, which is capital expenditure. Uh, what do you uh, uh, feel about the subject Mr. Sharma? I think the industry, the country desperately needs more investment in infrastructure. And I'm not an economist, so I can afford to say this. Push comes to shove. Spend on infrastructure projects because the gestation is very long and ask forgiveness from the rating agencies later. The telecom sector alone probably needs uh, something in the range of $100 billion over the next three years. The scale of investment needed is massive. Uh, private sector will make that investment. So it's not government money directly, but the government has, a, has been treating the telecom sector as a cash cow, both through spectrum fees and through a plethora of taxes. About 35% of the revenue of a telco goes to the government in one form of telecom-related tax or the other. I'm not talking income tax. If the government wants to achieve the objectives of Digital India, it needs to forego treating the sector as a cash cow, and the sector will then invest. But investment is essential. And it Mr. Kanna, uh, you come from a, a sunrise sector, literally. So <laughs> your views are going to be important too, because the government is giving a lot of thrust to solar power right now. Sure. Uh, well, let's, let's speak from the fiscal perspective uh, and taking a macro level of it. While we all believe that the governance and the fiscal discipline is very critical uh, you know, for, for any place, whether it's an organization or a government, and it's, it's very critical for especially those areas and, 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 and entities where you, you have a lot of cost for money too in that process. Having said that, uh, you see, if you look at it from a power perspective and in a country where we still have been around 300 million people without any power source, around 400 million people without a very, with a, with a erratic grid connectivity. Saying that there is a date has come and we have to recalibrate ourselves uh, to sh make sure that the process is adapted and then we, then we redefine it. I think we need to revisit the things the way we have now taken the ambition of providing power to the country, whether it's solar or wind or renewable or thermal. I think that's, that's very critical. I think another aspect which is very critical is that one needs to introspect and see that there is a gap which has emerges because of the process part or this is a gap which has emerges because of the intention was, was clued I think one has, when we'll go deep into it, you will realize that the process in which the whole investment follows and takes place is, is something which won't allow you to achieve your ambitions. 
So I think that's very critical to see that the end, whether the objectives are critical or the process through which you are meeting that objective, that becomes more critical and then you are losing what your intention was. Mr. Tanti, uh, why do you stand on this uh, issue? I think uh, it's a trade-off between uh, growth and fiscal deficit is always the, the challenge for the, any leader. But the current economic environment, when we see the global perspective versus the domestic, it is a great time and opportunity for us to invest in a, any infrastructure areas. Because this is the time for us when high commodity price is very low, the resources are enough available in the, in the domestic and global market. It is the right time to capture and create and stimulate the demand for the domestic market. Because there is no overseas any industries per se from India to there is much opportunity for us. So this is the way may require trade-off between fiscal deficit versus investment. When I see the five years before the, the CapEx investment versus today, almost 20-25% has reduced. So which is giving the cost of energy has gone down the same level and which can stimulate our uh, Make in India initiatives also because our economy is heavily depend on a, on a service economy and agriculture sectors. This is the high time for us to expand in the manufacturing base, bringing the low cost of energy. Because why compared to China we are not competitive? Because either our financial cost is higher for the manufacturing, or our uh, interest, uh, uh, sorry, our power cost is higher. And because of that, the manufacturing base is not competitive for the global market. Whatever we are using is for just domestic demand. So it has to go the contribution of the manufacturing for 20, 16% to, to 25% with the support of the infrastructures, whether it is a road infrastructure, whether it is a port infrastructure, whether it is a power sectors, all can stimulate that manufacturing base very, very strongly. So it's a very high time for us to invest. And I strongly believe and recommend the government should invest because private sector has a limited resources. They are stuck up in so many investment already. And other way, we can attract the FDI investment to invest in India. Do you agree with Mr. Tanti, Mr. Ramchand? Budget is not something which is written in stone. I don't think, you know, we can, we, everything that was predicted in the budget has happened in the last 12 months, particularly the crude prices. You know, I don't think the government at that point had even uh, iota of imagination that the crude prices will reach where they are, you know, and therefore they will have some amount of flexibility in, you know, in the revenues being collected and the spend going down fundamentally. I'm really not sure that, you know, that uh, we will see a whole host of spend, even though there may be a budgetary allocation. From my, what I heard is that out of that 46 or 50,000 crores that the ministry got, they'll probably return about 17, 18,000 crores. So there's actually not been too much of a spend. On the other hand, I think the private sector has suffered because of a host of issues. You see, uh, on the tax part, I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing MAT, we're seeing service tax, you're seeing income tax, you know, there's a huge amount of taxation on industry. And I think these two things need to, you know, give way at some point of time for industry to move forward. On, on the fiscal itself, I think I support Pawan's view. I think we have to be predictable. It's better to be safer and limit yourself to the deficit numbers rather than, you know, try and overachieve or do more than what's, what's required. Mr. Bevers, you have the advantage of having outside in perspective. What do you think India should be doing now? I think this, this budget, like almost any budget that um, unfortunate politicians have to face up to, has to meet three important tests. One is it has to send an appropriate signal about what the government is doing and what the economy is looking like. I think the second set of criteria it, are around direction setting. Um, again, um, and I'm, I bring it back to infrastructure and the infrastructure for logistics particularly, um, we need to see a continuation and delivery on some of the indications and announcements which we have already seen over the last 12 months. Um, and the third area I think it's, it's got to succeed on is, is dealing with one particular issue which is that of the cost of logistics. It, logistics costs in this country represent roughly 15% of GDP. 
our competitors are half that, roughly, which obviously feeds through to our competitiveness and our ability, therefore, to deliver on policies like Make in India. Um, but I think if the budget meets those tests and sends those signals and addresses those points, we will have gone a long way. Coming back to you, Pavan, uh, just to take you upon what you said, uh, you were trying to walk the proverbial middle line, uh, saying, yes, we need to stick to the target, but at the same time, we need to find resources to uh, spend. Now, uh, in this context, when tax revenues are not rising the way uh, they have to, at least direct taxes, and uh, market options for privatization or disinvestment not really uh, presenting themselves, what are, the, what are the avenues for raising extra budgetary resources for the government? How do you walk that middle line, which is going to be very difficult? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there, are, there are ways, uh, in our opinion, where you can leverage various external constituents. I think one of the ways in which government uh, has initiated that uh, is in form of the National Infrastructure Fund. How do, you, how do you invest a smaller amount and then collectively try and uh, use external stakeholders to put together what is needed as priorities for the economy? Uh, the, the second part of that will be how do you look at uh, the debt funding? And the debt funding presents far more uh, innovative options if you look at uh, enhancing the role of bond markets into the uh, into the infrastructure sector specifically. I think the third way uh, perhaps will also be, uh, may not be directly related to infrastructure, but strengthening the banking system and making sure that uh, we have a robust uh, banking system. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of the funding in the Indian infrastructure sector today done by the banking industry. Uh, if banks have their own balance sheets which are stronger, uh, capital uh, is, is uh, available, that should allow some of the interest costs pass through also uh, to happen. And, and that should again indirectly uh, allow for greater viability, I would say, of the infrastructure projects um, going forward. So that's perhaps, uh, those, those would perhaps be the ways in which some of this can be done. Now, if I were to ask you gentlemen on uh, what needs to be done to correct this, what is the, uh, uh, would, you, would you rather have the government target specific sectors with specific outlays and push that in a sustained way. Uh, is that a way out to uh, get out of this infrastructure uh, rut that we are in right now? Uh, Mr. Bevis, would you, uh, what has been your experience with Sagar Mada project until now? What do you think? Uh, is it a workable proposition? Yes, without doubt. There's no question that, that we, we need additional port capacity. Um, and therefore, I think um, the idea of a, of, a, of a network of ports, as is being proposed at the moment, is an inspired idea. Um, but clearly, and obviously that lies behind your question, um, that it isn't just enough to say, let's build the ports and put them here, here and here. There have to be a number of general policy considerations around the way in which you go about it. Um, and there need to be a number of very specific points to support all that. Um, in general terms, I think that the key ones are, firstly, um, we have to build for scale. Container shipping, and I'm principally talking about container shipping, is about scale. Secondly, um, as I have already touched on, I believe that we need to try and refrain ourselves or restrain ourselves as far as possible from reaching for the regulatory lever every time there is an, is an issue. Let the market be the regulator. That's the most efficient regulator, in my view. Clearly, that in turn means you've got to have the scale to, to build the effective market. The other general point I'd make is around the PPP model. We need to rebalance. Um, I believe that the, the, the balance has swung very much in favour of the landlord. It needs to be a balance. That's what PPPs imply, <coughs> partnership. It's a two-way street. Um, if those specifics can be dealt with, it will send strong signals to, to, to the marketplace, and thereby I think people will be the more encouraged to invest in things like Sagamala. Uh, Mr. Ramchand, uh, you were making the point that though 40,000 crores was allocated in the budget for more roads last year, only about uh, you know, 16, 17,000 crores would have been spent. What is uh, holding back? Uh, what is the problem? Why is it that uh, we're not uh, seeing projects being acted on? 
You see, what's happened is that government has moved completely to the, the pendulum has song from a pure PPP to a complete EPC now. You know, and, and I think this seems to be the trend in many infrastructure sectors where the government, I think, feels that uh, you know, there's a feeling or a sense that the PPP has failed. You know, and uh, and uh, they've, the PPP players have taken the banks for a ride, they've taken authorities for a ride, and you know, or they're, they're the bad boys in the, in the industry today. Uh, I think that's completely, uh, it, I use a strong word, I think it's completely wrong. I don't think it's, it's correct at all. I think what was missing in the last few years, and I think this is a phenomenon of the last few years, three, four years maybe, is the partnership has been forgotten. Now, if you look at banks, you know, you can't club an industry like producing uh, toothpaste with, you know, building a road. You know, if he doesn't pay you, you know, his capacity is utilized from day one. A road capacity is not utilized from day one. It takes 20 years by the time that capacity gets fully utilized. And, but you have the same norms for declaring an NPA. So the banks have become very wary that, you know, because you're definitely going to get demand. We've seen it on every PPP project that, you know, the demand has always come and met and has always been there. And here is where I think the Kelkar Committee report, if accepted in this budget in total, will be a big change because they're talking about all these things. Do you agree with that, Mr. Amit Sharma? PPP has been a bad word until now, but is that the way to go forward in building telecom infrastructure? However, if you look at the ambitions of digital India, and I'll include smart cities, because you can't have smart cities without ubiquitous broadband and many of the things that telecom brings, those are not possible except in a PPP model. So despite the antagonistic relationship that has, the industry has had with the government on telecom per se, we have to move to a new model where we are working together because until you can deliver broadband services to the village where e-health, e-education, banking services, uh, direct payments are actually happening, uh, you will not see the village economy improve, and if you don't see that improve, these programs will not be successful. But it cannot be done by the government. So fortunately, this is one of those few sectors where it's not purely a matter of government spending, but more a matter of the government recognizing that A, can only be done as a PPP, B, it has to be a true partnership. What the government gives is removing roadblocks, removing unnecessary regulations, and adapting to the times. I mean, it's not, you know, this notion that you can't predict for 25 years what's needed. You can predict for the next five years what would be needed in the first phase of rollout and have sensible governance bodies that allow you to adapt that. But in terms of removing roadblocks, uh, it's sad to say that these are entirely in the hands of the government. They could be done overnight. So somehow the signal is not there that, guys, we treat you as a partner. We will solve problems, your problems. The industry really isn't looking for government money to make these schemes work. And believe me, if they work, even in five years, we will see a difference, not just in rural economies, but the overall country. Mr. Kana, one industry that you uh, that doesn't really worry about PPP is yours. Uh, you, in fact, you're faced with a different set of problems altogether. Uh, I, there are two questions, basically, I would like to ask you and Mr. Tanti. Uh, first is uh, the falling solar tariffs. Uh, now, I want to know how realistic uh, are these tariffs and uh, projections are they'll fall further in the coming uh, months. And B, uh, what about indigenous manufacturing of solar panels? Uh, is that, uh, why is it not taking off and what are the issues there and what does the government need to do on those accounts? Sure. <coughs> well, uh, first thing, I think the government has done uh, I would say a very commendable job in coming to the solar sector or renewable with a target of 175 gigawatt. I think we have to give credit to, the, to that thought process and then working on it. And, and there is a sincerity and a lot of work has happened on that too. Uh, while we, we are mostly, I would say, sensitized by the uh, tariff numbers which comes, but the fact remains that uh, if you don't cap one tariff or look at it in, in general on average, the solar tariff today uh, at a bus bar level is definitely lower than your thermal imported coal-based uh, power which is produced. 
Having said that, there is also a factor, I think, which, which can help us immensely, and that is <coughs> while our focus is on the energy generation, if we also have focus towards manufacturing and developing these resources within the country, it will help us a lot more. While our focus currently, if you look at it, that most of the projects which are being developed, other than the one which government has decided as a DCR category, like they call it, they're all based on imported components of panels which are coming from outside. What is, what is very much required is that while the, the raw materials which we require for cells and panels within the country, there are no duties on it. The, pack, the capex which is required, there are not much incentives on it, and it's also duties which are there. And if you look at it, if Indian companies have to sustain the manufacturing, then they have to beat at a global level. Protectionism will not help beyond a certain uh, scale. So we need to come to that scale, and that scale needs support. That scale needs incentive at this stage. And I believe that it is also very critical, and that's my personal belief, that we should also support and encourage the technology part in it. Mr. So Tanti, uh, do you uh, agree with those views? No, I fully agree certain areas. <clears throat> Let me understand a little bit differently, because today the opportunity set by the government to reduce 33% carbon, uh, carbons in the, our uh, contribution in environment <coughs> and 40% renewable energy in the energy mix basket. If you talk only just energy for the renewable, I think $200 billion investment in the next five years. So that is a good uh, investment opportunity. But what I see, we have to leverage the inclusive opportunity also for the manufacturing, building the capacity, and export. So that will create an enormous you know, value chain jobs, not just to build the capacity on an import basis. So here it's a renewable energy to make India is the largest renewable energy hubs in our country is the great opportunity because we have already opened the size of the market, $200 billion size. So we have opportunity to manufacture the domestically. But the biggest constraint and bottlenecks, we are going a little bit uh, differently because we are going on a reduction on the tariff pricing. So whatever the tariff price is going five, six rupees to five rupees to four and 50 pesa, I think that will cannot support the manufacturing. So it's a strategic decision what really we want to position our country. Because I see the after the service, pharma, and renewable is the great opportunity for India to position for the global market, not just to target the domestic market. Because domestic market in the global market in renewable is just 3%. Right? We, we cannot make a scale on 3%, irrespective of 200 billion. But its startup point of view, it's a very good uh, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for a vibrant discussion.